So I, I, without further ado, I'd love to introduce our esteemed speaker today, who I had the pleasure of getting to, to chat with a little before everyone else came on. Sabrina Thomas, a, associate professor, uh, David A. Moore Chair in American History at Wabash uh, College. And uh, Ms. Ms. Thomas is the author of a new book, uh, Scar of War, the Politics of Paternity and Responsibility for Mara Asians of Vietnam. And um, we came to know about uh, Ms. Thomas uh, from Robert Hughes and her connection to Huntington. So we're, we're very excited for her to, to talk about her book and this topic that maybe a lot of us are not that familiar with um, on Euro Asians and uh, what happened during Vietnam and how it, it came to affect uh, some people uh, in Huntington. So I'm uh, happy to turn it over to our speaker for today. And uh, please, if you have any questions, put them in the chat uh, below and I'll hap happily uh, bring them up uh, as we uh, go along um, and as an appropriate. And uh, again, I wanna thank our sponsors, uh, People's United Bank for sponsoring our Lunch and Learns and for, um, everyone who attend is attending today. I'm gonna to mute myself. Awesome, thank you. Uh, I am just gonna share my screen, hopefully. Did that work for you all? Okay. Uh, okay, um, thank you for the, for the introduction, uh, Stephanie. We definitely um, had a good conversation while we were waiting for people to log on and um, I'm very happy to, to speak with all of you today. Um, I definitely wanna start um, by thanking, making sure I'm not muted, okay. <laughs> um, by thanking the, the Huntington Historical Society um, to, for the opportunity to talk with you and also to share um, what was a long uh, culmination of years of research, um, including a lovely few weeks that I spent in Huntington I think it was in 2018, I'm, I'm, it might, might've been 2017, um, where I spent researching in the archives um, in, in Huntington. Um, I'd also like to thank um, Huntington Town historian, Robert Hughes and Brian Hansen, the curator at the Huntington High School Heritage Room. Um, he was very helpful when I first began um, my project. Um, and of course, Stephanie for inviting me, me today and all of you for taking your lunch time to, to listen to me talk. Um, the title of my talk is called Saving Le Van Men. Um, and like Stephanie said, it's largely based on my book that was released in the fall, um, The Scars of War. Um, I'm particularly honored to have this conversation um, with all of you who live in Huntington and in some cases who may remember <laughs> some of the events um, of the and the efforts of the Huntington High School students to bring men um, from Vietnam to the United States in the 80s. Um, so if this rings a bell for anybody, I would definitely welcome your thoughts and your memories and your feedback. Since I started researching this topic in 2008, um, <laughs> Our country has um, experienced rising tensions over issues of immigration and refugees, um, race, citizenship, and, and war. And we're gonna go through this again, I expect here um, with Ukraine, um, but specifically um, tensions over who we are as a country, um, who we are as a people. Um, so for the past few years, I've been thinking a lot about what it means to be an American um, and what an American looks like. And ironically, I think it's those same questions that really emerged um, out of the events surrounding Le Van Men. I think his story and the bigger history of Amerasians in America actually really demonstrates the constant conflict in this country over ideas of race and nationality, legitimacy and responsibility, and citizenship. So I'm hoping that this talk um, begins a conversation of some kind um, about how we rely some, um, often on race to construct an American identity, um, socially, legally, and politically, and what exactly that, that means. So I'm gonna begin with a brief introduction, brief for a historian <laughs> um, and some background, um, and then with a story um, about war loss um, and, the power, and the power of youth. I do tend to talk fast, so if you need me to slow down, please say something or put something in the chat and I'll, um, I can see that. Um, most of this will come also from my book, so um, I'm gonna read um, a lot of it as if I were doing a book reading. Okay. 
Leyte Ba was barely a teenager when President Lyndon Johnson sent the first US combat troops into South Vietnam on March 8, 1965. Over the next decade, the war fought inside, outside, and over Vietnam disrupted Leyte Ba's life and the lives of her countrymen and women in violent and irreversible ways. Ultimately, the war killed over 3 million Vietnamese, disappeared 300,000 others, and obliterated the country on both sides of the divide with 5 million tons of bombs. As a young woman coming of age on the outskirts of war-torn Saigon, Leyte Ba faced a myriad of difficult choices. Like numerous other women in South Vietnam seeking to survive the war and to avoid starvation, she likely sought work on or near a US military base collecting American wages in exchange for various kinds of services. Perhaps she did domestic work, cooking, cleaning, laundering for US soldiers or civilians associated with the war effort. Maybe she understood that the more intimate labors of the flesh earned higher wages and joined the thousands of other women who worked in the seedy bars and brothels of Saigon or Da Nang. Possibly it was happenstance, a quiet walk to the market or a cheap pursuit by an American man. Or perhaps the intimate encounter between Le Thi Ba and the American soldier was of the more insidious and forceful kind, marked by the violence and desperation that always accompanies men in war. Regardless of the path she traveled, Leyte Ba survived the war, and like many other Vietnamese women, along the way, she met a US serviceman, and that encounter created a life. In 1971, two years before President Richard Nixon claimed to have achieved peace with honor and withdrew US combat troops from South Vietnam, 19-year-old Leyte Ba gave birth to Le Van Minh, the first of her four children and the only one fathered by an American serviceman. For the first years of his life, Le Van Min had a fairly uneventful childhood, raised by his mother and his grandmother in a poor neighborhood on the outskirts of Saigon. However, in 1975, at the age of three, life became more difficult as Min acquired polio, a debilitating disease that attacked and paralyzed his legs and prevented him from ever walking upright or unaided. In the decade after the Vietnam War, Min was one of the estimated 30 to 50,000 Amerasians, the children of American men and Vietnamese women born as a result of the war in Vietnam. Like men whose father disappeared shortly after his birth, the majority of Amerasians did not know their American fathers or lacked the necessary documentation to prove their American paternity. After the North Vietnamese communists declared victory in Vietnam, mothers of Amerasians feared their half American, quote, children of the enemy would face retribution, persecution, or even murder. So seeking to evade such a fate, some mothers destroyed evidence that their Amerasian children existed, including information about their American fathers, and others abandoned their Amerasian children entirely to orphanages or to the streets. When the communist retribution failed to materialize, however, these children with, quote, American faces came to exist as outcasts in the country of their birth. In Vietnam's patrilineal society, as in many Asian countries, race exacerbated the stain of illegitimacy and dictated their marginalization, as did their association with the Vietnam War. The Amerasians of Vietnam carried the unique burden of representing the nation's military and moral failings, the 58,000 American lives lost, the nation's abandonment of its South Vietnamese allies, and the immoral behavior of those who survived. But race also shaped the US response to the Amerasians and the humanitarian efforts to save them from what Americans perceived to be the dangers of Vietnamese communism. Unbeknownst to Min or his mother, the efforts to save him from Vietnam began decades before his birth, the global humanitarian concern that emerged from the tremendous numbers of people displaced, persecuted and orphaned during the Second World War. In the aftermath of that war, Americans embraced humanitarianism as part of their nation's exceptional global responsibility to rescue and to provide refuge for the world's persecuted and oppressed. And humanitarian organizations sent their resources across national borders to aid and assist those unable to help themselves. So to reinforce the nation's moral duty and to assuage concerns about aiding maybe the wrong kind of people and to justify the sending of food and aid to former enemies, during the Cold War, US leaders focused specifically on saving children, tying humanitarianism and family to US foreign policy. So US leaders politicized child saving aid as the key to promoting the benefits of democracy abroad 
pairing images of suffering, often non-white and foreign children with the nation's Cold War duty to rescue them through transborder child-saving acts of sponsorship and adoption as a moral responsibility and a civic duty. U.S. servicemen have a long and extensive history of fathering and abandoning illegitimate half-American children abroad, especially in Asia, where U.S. military interventions had produced tens of thousands of mestizos in the Philippines, rainbow babies in Japan, and mixed-blood children in South Korea. In each case, questions of paternity, illegitimacy, and responsibility challenged U.S. leaders to consider the complexities that result when war produces children who are both transracial and transnational. And in each case, U.S. leaders rejected taking responsibility for those children by deferring to U.S. citizenship law. Since 1864, this law has ensured that while children born abroad to American women are automatically American citizens, children born abroad to American men are only citizens if the father claims them. So while American mothers automatically transmit citizenship to their children, American fathers do not. So American men, and in this case, and in the case of the Amerasians, American servicemen, had no legal obligation for their children or for the children of their foreign girlfriends or lovers. And their children had no legal grounds for paternal legitimacy or for US citizenship. But as America went to war in Vietnam, the future of abandoned illegitimate half American children and the implications for US foreign policy during the Cold War really worried humanitarians who pressed Congress to reconsider the nation's paternal responsibility. There were a number of transnational adoption agencies that specialized in finding good American homes for illegitimate and orphaned Asian, Asian and Amerasian children. And like political leaders, these organizations also linked US citizenship and national security with parenthood and family and encouraged Americans to help the nation contain communism by adopting Asian children. During the Vietnam War, fears that orphaned and stateless half American children might become purveyors of anti-Americanism were spread to encourage Americans to adopt. Humanitarian organizations made a specific appeal to the parental instincts of Americans concerned about the fate of abandoned American children in Vietnam. And in addition to promoting the need for child sponsorship or child assistance and aid, these organizations also began asserting the nation's paternal responsibility to save the Amerasians in Vietnam through immigration rights and by granting them US citizenship. So questions of citizenship became the backdrop for the American response to the Amerasians in Vietnam. Humanitarians invoked it as an official marker of paternity and legitimacy and US lawmakers asserted its importance to national identity and responsibility. Race was also critical. American and Vietnamese leaders, US lawmakers and humanitarians disagreed on whether the Amerasians race made them American or Asian and which country was therefore ultimately responsible for saving them. So while skin color compounded issues of illegitimacy in Vietnam, confirming assumptions of American paternity and marking the Amerasians for lives of exclusion and accusations that they were not Vietnamese. In the United States, skin color bolstered claims of legitimacy. So for those Amerasians whose skin color and physical features aligned with American racial stereotypes of whiteness or blackness, race effectively ascribed them an American identity and made them American. Those whose racial features were less pronounced were assumed to be racially Asian and therefore not American. So while the confusion over the Amerasians race and nationality informed the inability of US leaders to reconcile the Amerasians racial hybridity and hindered their efforts to legislate paternal responsibility, it also shaped the humanitarian response. Debates over whether the Amerasians were white or black American children or Asian child victims or refugees proved critical to how lawmakers understood the nation's responsibility to save them. Finally, even though citizenship never materialized in legislation, it elicited important discussions about what it meant to be an American and whether the Amerasians were American or if they could become American. Between 1970 and 1975, as Americans watched a failing war effort in Vietnam become a growing and embarrassing humanitarian problem, US policymakers, including Democratic Representative Patsy Mink and Senator Ted Kennedy, joined humanitarian organizations like the Pearl S. Buck Foundation and Save the Children 
to call on the US government to do something about its orphaned American children in Vietnam and to bring them home to the land of their fathers. To garner political support, proponents ascribed American racial categories onto the Amerasians, believing that classifying the Amerasians as white or black American children would help convince Americans of their duty to save them from Vietnam. But opponents, including African-American leaders, viewed such efforts to racialize the Amerasians into Americans as disingenuous, and they emphasized the other side of the Amerasian mixture. They insisted that race did not make the Amerasians American, but rather confirmed that they were Asian and were therefore neither American children nor an American responsibility, and thus did not need to be saved. Black leaders were not wrong for their criticism or their concern. At the time, the presidential administration of Richard Nixon was suffering international condemnation for abandoning American children in Vietnam, and he was under increasing pressure from US policymakers like Mink and Kennedy to take national paternal responsibility by bringing all of the Amerasians to the United States. <clears throat> However, Nixon had little interest in even acknowledging the Amerasians. He believed the illegitimate and abandoned children of US soldiers would simply add another black mark to America's questionable war record and further scrutiny of the behavior of US soldiers in Vietnam. So while denying the United States had any culpability for the Amerasians, the Nixon administration sought a humanitarian remedy that offered the optics that America was saving its children, but excused the US government from actually taking responsibility through paternal, paternal legitimacy, immigration rights or citizenship. So photographs of US troops building orphanages and stories of American families embracing their adopted Vietnamese and, Amer and Amerasian children, he thought could counter criticisms of troop immorality and child abandonment. However, South Vietnam rejected this humanitarian approach. The nation had grown increasingly distrustful of its American ally whose own people and soldiers seemed to be losing faith in Nixon and in the war. Furthermore, South Vietnam's president increasingly understood Nixon's policy of Vietnamization as code for the slow American abandonment of South Vietnam and the war rather than a winning strategy. Their suspicions made the South Vietnamese very wary of US intentions regarding the Amerasians specifically and resistant to sending any of their children to the United States where they feared Americans would abuse or exploit them for political gain. Ultimately, South Vietnamese officials criticized America's child saving methods for all of its children, including the Amerasians, insisting the country that created the war could not claim to rescue its victims. Eager to relinquish responsibility for the Amerasians, the, the Nixon administration agreed, stating that it did not consider the Amerasians an American issue because they were not American citizens, and so there was no need to save them. By the end of the war, Huntington, was an unwitting part of the Nixon administration's public relations approach. Residents and their Long Island neighbors showed concern for American allies and victims of the war, and a number of local families offered shelter and opportunity to those whose lives the war had upended. In 1975, Newsday reported the efforts of the Huntington community to save Son Tran, a Vietnamese exchange student attending Huntington High School on a one-year scholarship. After Son Tran's father wrote him in April 1975, expressing fear for his family's escape for, from South Vietnam and for his son's safety, and explaining that his son could not return home. Huntington residents, students, and teachers worked to save Son Tran from the war, initiating fundraisers to ensure his safety, his acceptance, and his opportunity in America. And this effort was consistent with what was a local culture and history of selfless service, sacrifice, and humanitarianism, as well as a deep connection to the Vietnam War. We'll come back to that. By 1980, so we've skipped ahead, American media sources had flooded newspapers, magazine articles, and television programs with the American faces and sad stories of abandonment, discrimination, and exclusion of the Amerasians in Vietnam. Years removed from the Nixon administration's position that the Amerasians were not American children, many US policy, policymakers now changed their tune. As they increasingly believed the Amerasians to be American children, they also now sought a humanitarian remedy for their lives in Vietnam. So in 1981, Republican Representative Stuart McKinney proposed the Amerasian Immigration Act, a bill to amend US immigration law to provide the tens of thousands of qualifying Amerasians in Southeast Asia, those with proof of paternity and an American sponsor, 
preferential immigration status, classifying them as the children of United States citizens. Notably, that coverage introduced Americans to the hundreds of young Amerasian kids now living in the streets of Ho Chi Minh City, who often surrounded Western journalists and tourists and even Vietnam War, vet Vietnam War veterans, asking them if they were their fathers. Since the end of the Vietnam War, a popular but often false narrative had emerged that all of the Amerasians in Vietnam were abandoned, were orphaned street children, whose American faces marked them for discrimination and marginalization. But in reality, while reports did confirm their marginalized status in Vietnamese society, the majority of Amerasians in Vietnam were not homeless and they were not orphans. Rather, studies found that 75% of the Amerasians identified their mother or grandmother as their primary caretaker and 8% lived with adoptive parents. But recognizing the power of pity, US and Vietnamese officials reinforced the portrayal of the Amerasians as homeless and suffering war orphans but shifted the narrative in terms of who was to blame. Vietnam officials condemned the United States for abandoning its children and promoted the Amerasians as just another example of the hypocrisy of an American democracy that failed to fulfill its international and humanitarian obligations. In contrast, members of Congress and the Ronald Reagan administration continued to view the Amerasians through a Cold War lens as the persecuted orphan victims of the evil Vietnamese communists. By framing the Amerasians as a population the United States could save from communism, rather than one it irresponsibly reproduced, American leaders could enhance the nation's global humanitarian reputation and condemn communism and Vietnam. The ability of Americans to personalize the Amerasians and recognize them as both abandoned and American children proved critical to the US narrative. Only by imagining the Amerasians as forsaken and ascribing them an American identity could the United States properly save them from communism? For their part, the Amerasians begging on the streets of Saigon were also well-versed in the power of story, and they invested fully in the American narrative. Survival on the streets required a certain kind of savvy, and the Amerasians quickly discovered that the combination of their American looks with their stories of abandonment, with stories of abandonment and abuse, proved particularly effective at provoking an emotional response from Westerners that equated to food, goods, and money. By exploiting the lingering tensions of war and guilt in employing the power of their paternity, some Amerasians, especially those with really clear Western features, perfected the art of an emotional diplomacy critical to their survival. Americans in particular soothed their guilt through giving in hopes that these tiny contributions to these homeless children might atone for their sins and offer some of the Amerasians relief. Among one of those groups of kids was 10-year-old Le Van Min, whose clearly American face and physical deformities captured the attention of tourists and of CBS News reporter Mike Wallace, who was doing a story on the consequences of the war. Likely because of his physical challenges, his American features, and his age, men's Amerasian peers often deliberately placed him at the front of the pack. The more attention and sympathy they could garner from foreigners, the more money they could make. Although men's physical challenges were the result of polio, those who saw men often wrongly assumed him to be the victim of Agent Orange poisoning, which made him an even more tragic figure. For his part, Le Van Min proved to be a gifted diplomat telling different versions of his personal story to sympathetic Americans, including Mike Wallace. Although the story that men told was generally true, the details around his homelessness and his abandonment seemed to shift depending on the audience. So while men begged for money to feed his mother and his stepfather and his brothers, he understood that he could provoke a more lucrative response from Westerners by making himself an orphan who was first abandoned by his American father and then rejected by his Vietnamese mother. At times, men would falsely claim that his mother had died. Still, such story shifts by men and other Amerasians were central to their survival, an assertion of agency critical for a population with very little power. As Congress was engulfed in contentious debates over the Amerasian Immigration Act that centered on disagreements over whether race or paternity made the Amerasians American and whether that equated to citizenship, Mike Wallace's documentary, Honor Thy Children, aired on 60 Minutes, capturing the plight of the Amerasians in Vietnam, along with an Emmy nomination. 
His report highlighted the tragedy of the Amerasians abandonment and, and marginalization in Vietnam and incited American sympathy and support for the Amerasians at a really critical point for the, for the uh, AIA, the, the Amerasian Immigration Act. Notably, Wallace did not blame American fathers for deserting their children or Vietnam's communist government for persecuting them. Rather, Wallace suggested that the real culprit was the US government. The Reagan administration, he implied, prevented American veterans who wanted to father their American children from retrieving them from Vietnam. To prove the point that the Amerasian problem was one of policy rather than persons, Wallace presented evidence throughout the report that Amerasians were in fact American and not Vietnamese. In the closing moments of his show, amidst an array of photographs of American-faced Amerasian children, Wallace summed up the feudal situation facing the Amerasians in Vietnam, explaining to his audience that, quote, only a handful of Amerasian children, perhaps a dozen, have been able to immigrate to the United States from Vietnam. And he reminded viewers that Vietnam was willing to release all of the Amerasians to the United States and that the Amerasian Immigration Act was currently under consideration in Congress. So for many American viewers, the report was a powerful visual reminder of America's war in Vietnam and of the nation's responsibility to the Amerasian children. Ironically, Wallace did not profile Le Van Min and his cameraman even failed to capture his image. So if you were looking in this photo for somebody who looked like the person I described, he's not there. <laughs> Still, Wallace reminded American viewers that they had a responsibility to save the Amerasians in Vietnam, which they could do by pressuring their congresspersons to pass the Amerasian Immigration Act. These efforts appeared to pay off. On October 22nd, 1982, President Reagan signed the Amerasian Immigration Act into law describing it as a reflection of American humanitarianism and a commitment to family reunification. However, while the final bill did recognize the Amerasians as the children of American citizens for the purpose of immigration rights, it did not grant them citizenship. Additionally, it included a number of restrictions that made it practically useless, specifically in Vietnam, where the absence of diplomatic relations prevented its implementation. So in its short duration, the Immigration Act facilitated the immigration of only 165 Amerasians total. 156 of those came from South Korea and only four came from Vietnam. Three years later, in October, 1985, Newsday photographer Audrey Tiernan met the now 14-year-old Le Van Min while on assignment in Ho Chi Minh City. The daughter of an American serviceman killed in the Vietnam War, Tiernan felt Min tug at her leg while walking along the river where her father's ship used to dock. Quote, I thought it was a cat or a dog, Tiernan explained. I looked down and saw that it was a human being. He had a twisted spine and he was literally scurrying around the streets like a crab. I was so repulsed I couldn't even bring myself to take his picture. But when I looked closer, I said, oh my God, he's an American. It took only a moment for Tiernan to recognize the American in Min's face. His sand, sandy brown hair and big brown eyes overpowered the awkward bends and contortions in his limbs and his spine, too frail and damaged to hold his body upright. Fascinated by Min, and quote, this shocking juxtaposition of his sweet, beautiful face and his twisted body, end quote. Tiernan focused her camera and took his picture. Tiernan's picture of Le Van Min appeared on the front pages of Newsday on November 4th, 1985. In the photo, Min is oddly bent at the waist, standing on all fours, holding an origami flower made out of cigarette wrappers in one hand. The strength of his body defies any of the disabling effects of its glaring physical deformities, and his eyes stare directly into the camera. 63-year-old Gloria Blavelt, a public relations worker for the Huntington School District, saw Min's photo when she opened her morning paper. Like many other Newsday readers, the powerful picture struck her hard. Perhaps idealistic in her own thinking, Blavelt knew she had to do something to help the crippled boy in the photo and to bring him to America. So with the support of Huntington High School principal, Jim Salvatore, I hope I said his name right, Blavelt showed Min's picture and the article to the HHS student government and challenged members to do something. Upon seeing it, student body president David Zack and committee members Marlo Sandler, Sue Fort, and Tara Scalia gasped out loud. The picture, Zack explained, disturbed them, an image of a contemporary crawling like a crab in ragged clothes. 
So the students quickly accepted Blavelt's challenge and focused their efforts on bringing men to the United States for humanitarian reasons, to provide him the medical treatment necessary to save his life. Although they did not know it at the time, the HHS students had a lot in common with men. They were all teenagers, born in the last days of the Vietnam War to parents who lived through the conflict. As in many small towns and tight-knit communities across the United States and in numerous villages and cities in Vietnam, the Vietnam War left lasting scars on Huntington. It divided neighbors, disrupted families, and inserted political tension into once amical social gatherings. Local families sacrificed 43 sons to the conflict, including two whose remains were never found. Such loss and sacrifice weighed heavily on Huntington residents who shared the burden of the war with other small communities across the country and across the Pacific Ocean in Vietnam. Quote, the, death, the deaths of others took something out of all of us, a local reporter wrote, the same with the wounded and of those who served in a far off foreign land. Still, even those Huntington residents who condemned the war remained steadfast in their support for the service and sacrifice of US soldiers and to helping those most affected by the war. The next generation of Huntington youth, although born one step removed from Vietnam, shared similar humanitarian impulses. The children of those who fought to save Song Tran came of age with the rhetoric, idealism, and hope characterized by Ronald Reagan's exceptional America, in which the Vietnam War was noble and the US soldiers and US soldiers were heroes. Hence, by the time members of the HHS student government began their year-long grassroots campaign to bring Le Van Min to the United States on humanitarian grounds, students were well-versed in their nation's exceptionalism and in their community's humanitarian acts of saving. As Huntington High School students hit the pavement, garnering support from Huntington residents and their local congressmen to save Le Van Min, including numerous hours spent at the Walt Whitman Mall talking to community members and asking them to, quote, help bring Le Van Min to the United States, they were careful to distinguish men from the tens of thousands of other Amerasians still living on the streets in Vietnam, framing their efforts to rescue men as a unique humanitarian case. While most media accounts emphasize the American fraternity of the Amerasians, in its coverage of the HHS efforts, Newsday made very few references to men's American paternity, emphasizing instead his physical challenges while printing numerous photographs of his American face. By not discussing men's paternity directly, Newsday effectively distanced readers from any guilt or culpability for men while simultaneously evoking sympathy and a sense of responsibility to save the child whose face looked so familiar. Hence, Newsday readers understood the efforts on men's behalf were strictly humanitarian and in no way motivated by his American paternity or the tens of thousands of other Amerasian kids just like him. Despite the fact that discussions of men's American paternity remain muted, it was, it was men's American face, in quotes, not his disability, that had moved Audrey Tiernan to take this picture. Viewed in color, the picture clearly shows men's light brown hair and hazel eyes. In black and white, the photograph darkens the color of both. Yet when describing men, media reports assigned him specific characteristics associated with whiteness, the color of his eyes. Newsday reporters consistently describe men as having blue eyes, straight black hair and freckles, and as, quote, a street beggar with blue eyes and freckles who crawls on all fours. In March 1987, reporter Irene Virag outlined the difficulties facing men in Vietnam, writing that the absence of diplomatic relations between the United States and Vietnam, quote, makes it impossible to bring a single blue-eyed child to the land of his father. One month later, Virag described men specifically as the blue-eyed boy who lives half a world away. It was not until Virag met men in May 1987 that her description became more realistic. Hazel eyes and severely cropped hair. Like those reporters who never met men or never saw him in person or who failed to examine his photographs in color, sorry, likely those reporters who never met men or failed to examine his photographs in color simply projected their own ideas of what men looked like into their stories, inserting their own assumptions of uh, assumptions that men's quote, white American father would necessarily have passed on the trait of blue eyes to his son. They possibly knew that such a discourse would garner the sympathy of Newsday readers ultimately selling more papers. Or perhaps when reporters looked at men, they simply saw what they wanted to see, a fair skinned, half-American boy with blue eyes, 
who needed America to save him. The use of such a, what I've called a racialized discourse of humanitarianism, personalized men's medical condition for many readers and reinforced the humanitarian necessity of his case. Blue eyes may have made men seem more plausibly American and thereby worthy of humanitarian assistance. However, the very clear connotation between blue eyes and whiteness carries some bigger questions about men's case. Would the reaction from Newsday readers or the high school students have been the same had men's face not been so familiar? Would the students have perceived men as their contemporary had he been full Vietnamese rather than Amerasian? How might they have responded had men's father been black? 30 years later in a cafe in San Francisco, Marlo Sandler, one of the HHS students, wondered the same things. Quote, I wish I could go back in time and observe our behaviors then and understand what role that could have played. Just like the fact that his eyes were blue. I remember that now so much that people always commented on his beautiful eyes. But what if he was darker skinned and his eyes were dark brown? Would this not have resonated in the same way? That bothers me, she said, and I've thought about that a lot. But in 1986, such unspoken notions of race shared by both the high school students and the journalists who advocated for men's rescue exposed the role that race played in his saving. While those involved did not intentionally consider men's skin color, his features, or his familiarity, these traits likely did contribute to their activism on his behalf, and later to the overwhelming support by American policymakers to save all of the Amerasians in Vietnam. As one 16-year-old high school student explained while looking at men's photo, quote, look at that face. How could you not do anything? We had to do something. On May 26, 1987, almost one year after the HHS students began their campaign, Congressmen and Vietnam War veterans, Robert Mrazek and Thomas Ridge, arrived in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. Their mission was to save 15-year-old Le Van Minh on humanitarian grounds, and it had the joint approval of the United States government and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Two weeks later, and holding men gingerly in his arms at New, York, at New York's JFK airport, Congressman Razek pledged to save all of the Amerasians in Vietnam and to bring them home to the United States. Over the next few months, he successfully ushered the Amerasian Homecoming Act through Congress, which, which designated all identified Amerasians in Vietnam to be children of United States citizens and granted them and their family members immigration rights to the United States with refugee benefits. While the Homecoming Act did not grant the Amerasians US citizenship, it did ultimately facilitate the immigration of over 69,000 Amerasians and their family members before American leaders agreed that the Amerasians had in fact been properly saved. Within a year of his arrival in America, the poster child for the Homecoming Act had melted into the shadows of American society. Like many Amerasians, men, had a difficult time adjusting to life in America. And America had a hard time understanding men. No medical solution to fix his legs ever materialized. And since there were never any serious attempts made by those who saved men to find his father or to grant him citizenship, he entered the US foster care system, moving around to three different homes before finally settling in San Jose, California. I have to admit that I was never able to actually find men or to talk to him for my own research. Um, but at last account, as an adult, men continue to struggle with the challenges that many Amerasians faced, posed by limited language, education, and job skills, including an inability to pass the U.S. citizenship test and to legally become American. It is possible that over time, men recognize the irony of being rescued from his homeland because his American father had abandoned him, only to be abandoned again by those who saved him. However, men remained adamant that he was better off in America than he would have been in Vietnam. 13 years after coming to the United States, men told a reporter that in America, at least you have hope. Each of these stories offers a brief glimpse into the efforts of US humanitarians and lawmakers and high school students to save the Amerasians of Vietnam. They expose the continued challenge in using race to determine paternity and then nationality. And they remind us of how race is often used to produce citizens and non-citizens 
and how mixed race transnational persons continue to confound US leaders and US laws. They also reveal how race determined whether or not at different points in time, Americans believed the Amerasians were in need of being saved from Vietnam, who was responsible and what that saving looked like. Critically, I think this story also reveals the power of youth in affecting real change. By controlling the narrative of abandonment and abuse, the Amerasian kids in Vietnam created a sympathetic American audience eager to address their struggles. While in the United States, the high school students filled with the naivete of youth and idealism of an exceptional America garnered the necessary political support and media attention that forced policymakers to engage in Cold War diplomacy and to do something about the Amerasians. So I think in these ways, Min's case and the efforts to pass the Homecoming Act exposed the potential power of children to be community activists and de facto diplomats and to be symbols of national identity. And I think that that broadens our conventional understanding of who qualifies as a political actor, what characterizes diplomacy, and how children led the efforts to save men and all of the Amerasians in Vietnam. So today, policymakers continue to reconsider and to reconstitute the role of race in determining who is and who is not an American. US leaders seek to redefine the nation and its citizens in increasingly narrow ways. And even now, almost 40 years after calls to save Le Van Min brought him to the United States, the notions of Americans saving or not saving children in other countries continues to force a consideration of what it means to be an American and what it means to become one. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sabrina. That was, it was very interesting. How, my, my question to you is how did, how did this story uh, you know, how did you uh, learn about this story and what made you interested in this topic? Um, I know you're an American history person, but how did this, you know, come into your life, the story? Yeah, it kind of happenstance. Um, I was kind of searching for a topic in graduate school. Um, I didn't really know what I was interested in. I knew the Vietnam War period I was interested in, but I couldn't, lots, so much has been written about Vietnam. I couldn't quite find something that was unique. And then my my advisor um, wrote the name Amerasian down on a piece of paper and said, ah, I think you'll, you'll be interested in this. Go look these kids up. And so I just Googled it and was kind of shocked by the photos um, that I saw and, I, and a, a confused a little bit and my own reaction to like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> being confused by the faces that I'm seeing in Vietnam um, and the languages, if videos and things that they're speaking, um, that for me was kind of enough to get me hooked. When I discovered the high school student connection, I was even more interested in, in, in the story because I'm very, um, I'm very interested in the ways that young people empower um, legislation. And in this case, it, it's so little known, but those, it's because of those students that 69,000 kids came over um, from Vietnam. And so I, I thought that was just a story that needed to be told. Okay, so we have some other, thank you. Some, so one, our former director, Tracy, uh, said, what a fascinating talk. Thank you for sharing your research. Um, you. How long did men stay in Huntington? That was one of the questions uh, from- uh, Yeah, he wasn't here, he wasn't there very long. Um, so he arrived in um, June and he left sometime in September. He was with a, um, the Kenny family who, was, who had offered to adopt him. They had some Korean um, adoptees. And right. so they thought this, this would work. Um, and it, it, it was not a good fit. It didn't sound like for either side, but men really had a hard time trying to adjust to life in American culture. <laughs> um, time, eat when you eat, when you sleep, um, going to school, which was I think a struggle for, for him. And I don't think, um, Huntington was prepared for what he would need um, to learn the at his age to learn the language and to be able to 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 learn anything from school. So it, I think it was in about September in, in August. I know he started to apply for his mom to come to the United States, um, and then in September I think he moved to a foster care home uh, in Utica, and and that kind of began his his foster care um, career uh, until he ended up in San Jose.
Yeah, because someone in the chat was asking you answer that question that he, he ended up, he didn't work out in Huntington and he ends up in the foster care system. And you said that at the end of your- uh, Yeah, of the under yeah he year. did come back the next, uh, so he was back in Huntington in October, I believe he came back for homecoming. He was part of a homecoming parade. Um, and then he um, showed up in the yearbook from that next year. Um, so I'm not clear if he actually came back to, to campus, but he did show up in the yearbook um, th that next year as part of you know, one of the things Huntington had done um, by bringing him to the United States. So as being that you're a professor, do you use, uh, do you use this story to connect to, to uh, today? We were talking about that prior to us coming on with the rest yeah. of the group um, about, I mean, you have race, you have, you have, you, you have activism of the, of, of, of young people, um, you have a, a, a history, you know, Vietnam, that's not the most popular time of history. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, negativity associated with Vietnam as well. Um, yeah. You know, so do you are you able to use this research in your classes that you teach uh, today? Yeah, I actually, so I use it um, in my Vietnam class for sure, um, but I also use it in classes on immigration um, and, and on, on citizenship. Um, because the, the question of what it what an American looks like is one that has kind of always been part of the American um, fabric. <laughs> we never say it, um, but it's always kind of been there, um, you know, from 1790, if you were, you know, Irish or Italian, you weren't, you didn't really count, right? And so how that's kind of evolved. Um, and the students find it um, fascinating. I often do, do this, a project where they have to kind of decide which of these kids is an American and, and his face is on there too. And they struggle, they really struggle to, to do that and to understand what the um, requirements are, <laughs> right? So that, so that allows us to get a, lo a lot of good conversations about, well, what are the requirements and the politics of, of things? And in this case, the politics of war, um, which again, I think we're going to see again with as Ukrainian refugees continue to cross borders and at some point, I expect if it gets worse, the United States will step in and will accept or not accept certain certain folks, children or not children, depending on certain qualities that we want or don't want. And those discussions will happen. Um, so, so I do use it in class um, for that. I do also use it um, in class to talk about the Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And I've talked to a lot of local Vietnam veterans about it. Most Vietnam veterans I've interacted with absolutely knew about these kids. Many of them had them, although <laughs> whether they tell me or not um, is different, but they all have, have, they all at this point in their lives seem to have a lot of regret about what, what we did or didn't, didn't do um, for them. So that's also a really interesting conversation now for veterans who are at their, the point in their lives where they're kind of trying to reconcile some of what happened um, as they get older in age. Well, it's I think it's a it's a topic that I didn't know uh, very much about. And I think you brought a lot a lot of things to light, um, all the different aspects of it, because it, there's so many dimensions to this topic. It, you know, um, it, it's from the from the public policy to the, the humanitarian effort, activism, race, um, you know, and even that, like you said, the idea of what it means to be an American and um, I think, you know, in light of what's all the things that have gone on in the last couple of years, um, it's something we're still struggling with as a country, you know? Yeah. So yeah. I think um, it's, uh, but really fantastic. And I hope everyone uh, gets a chance to, to if they haven't read uh, uh, Sabrina's book, um, to do that. I put it in the, in the, um, in the chat. Um, and um, I also, as I said, we'll put it in the, um, oh, someone has another question. Uh, extend the question of citizenship to the status of children of, ens of enslaved mothers. Um, did you extend the question of citizenship to the status of, of the children of enslaved mothers? Yeah, so meaning that they inherited the, they inherited citizenship, um, they inherited the status of, of their mothers versus their fathers, I'm assuming. Um, so it's a similar tool right to to um force a, a certain status it, it the outcome is a little bit different but of course um but for sure the the tool of of matrilineal descent was employed right to ensure that slavery could be self-reproducing um and in this case the tool of matrilineal descent is is employed with military specific to um children born abroad because of the U.S. military endeavors abroad, so for the purpose of not <laughs> not reproducing um, citizens, 
So yeah, I do, I do would extend it to, to slavery's uh, matrilineal descent. I think, um, I think it's a carefully crafted use of um, US law to ensure that we can take response, we can have certain kinds of citizens or, or not have them and to ensure that our fighting forces um, don't have to worry about impregnating women. <laughs> And then we have to take care of the take care of the kids. And I, you know, I don't know. How, um, I don't. The law has not changed. The Supreme Court has revisited this law in various cases, dealing often with these sorts of children, um, or as early as the early two thousands. Um, and they're they're still committed to the idea that well, fathers don't actually know if that's their kid. Mothers are easy. They bird them. We see that's you know. It, that's an American, that's an easy connection. Fathers, that women lie, fathers don't know. There's all kinds of kind of gendered <laughs> things that go into that. Um, so I don't expect that to change, but I do, from what I've, from my understanding, the military has started to change kind of the way that it deals with this a little bit better. Um, our war in the Middle East was a good transition point because there's not a lot of relationships between American men and Middle Eastern women for cultural reasons. Um, but there were a lot of Eastern European women that were um, around for those to meet those needs. And so conversations still kind of go um, around those relationships. Um, and so I'll be interested to see in the next 10 years or so when research starts coming out, um, what the military did um, in terms of forcing fathers to take responsibility or fathers who want to take responsibility, which is the other issue that the military also doesn't, didn't allow. Um, so yes, there, there's a connection. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That, yeah. no, that, no, but that's great. The, I mean, you want to answer the question fully. Um, so again, I, I want to, want to thank uh, Ms. Thomas for, for speaking with us. And um, uh, you know, if there's other topics that are you, if you write another book or there's other topics we could discuss sure. about and present, um, I, you know, you're, you're a wonderful speaker. So um, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule and uh, coming on early as you're on Denver time. Yeah, it was great. <laughs> so I really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, can I, can I just say my book is um, kind of expensive now. If you wait until the fall, it'll get cheaper because then it'll be paperback. So <laughs> I just want to say, say that. But um, also, um, if there's, if anyone has any um, connections with any of the, because I know the book review closed. So if, uh, and I have emailed the, its predecessor, but please feel free to, if, if you liked what you heard to tell them that <laughs> I would love to, to have the book there. And I, I, it would be really interesting, I think, to have some of those students who are now adults come back and maybe talk about their experience too. So if that's ever something um, that is any of interest in Huntington, please, please keep me in mind. And, and also those students, I think they absolutely that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, thank you to our sponsor, People's United Bank, for uh, sponsoring our Lunch and Learns and for our members uh, supporting us and for taking the time to uh, sign in today. Okay.